Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism Midweek Shows. Uh, it's been a few weeks since we'll, we'll be holding our midweek shows. As you know, we've been touring in March. We toured. Scotland with the Prism show and that was taken up midweek and and the weekend shows. Well, we're back. Um, things are uh, still happening in the world that we need to know about and be aware of. Um, and a lot of the things we try to tell you on here are things that you will not hear from the, the Western major to give you a balance. You make up your own mind. Um, we don't try to do that for you. We just try and lay out some facts for you. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm joined by two of our midweek regulars. Uh, Lloyd there, Lloyd Quinnan in Edinburgh. Hi, Roddy. Hi, Lloyd. Nice to see you again, my friend, as always. <laughs> and we are joined by our friend over there in Ireland, Finbar. Finbar Hi, guys. Um, How are you? Scott. It's great to see you again. And you too, and hello, Scotland and beyond. Uh, and you, indeed. Lloyd. Yeah. We've missed you, Finbar. We've missed you. We've missed your oh. updates on what's going on um, over there in Ukraine, because we're certainly, unless... People who are watching are using Telegram and other uh, places. They're not getting the full picture. Could you give us a quick update as you, you normally do on what's, what the situation is in, uh, over there in Ukraine? Because it's with Gaza and one thing or another, it seems to be getting forgotten again. I, well, the people are still dying in massive numbers, being pulverized. Mm. Uh, the missiles are still flying. Uh, I think the last time we spoke, Avdivka had fallen. Uh, the, the Russian forces were moving west of Avdivka, had a number of successes with three or four different settlements uh, to the west of Avdivka. That has continued. Uh, there are certain areas that the Russians are finding some challenges in. Uh, Chasavyar is one of them. They, they've had some problems there. Uh, what's obviously happening on the, on the front line in terms of the difficulties that the Russians are facing is where Ukrainians are holding high ground. It's a greater challenge to try to take uh, those areas. So that's where the problem is there. But the progress generally has been advancement, incremental advancement on the part of Russian forces. And that hasn't changed for the last nine, ten months at least, where the Russians have been in a in a dominant position. It would appear that most of Ukraine's air defences have now been taken out. The Russians have a lot freer access to the air, which means that they can use different types of missiles and different types of drones at a further range than they could beforehand. I think this is evidenced with the way the Russians last week and the week before took out a massive amount of Ukrainian energy infrastructure in particular, but also drone factories, uh, mechanical uh, warehouses, and also areas where they'll fix uh, heavy military machinery. The Russians have been able to take that out with little to no air defense resistance. Now, there's two reasons why there may be no air defense resistance. One is that they decided not to reveal where their air defense systems are. Every time they fire an air defense missile, the Russians can then pinpoint locate where the air defense system is and take it out. And the other reason might be that they have none left. I suspect that it is the latter reason because the reports of HIMAR systems, uh, Patriot systems, things that have been taken out uh, increased over the last couple of months to the extent that you think they can't have very much left. There is a lot of talk about preparation for an advancement on the part of the Russian forces against the Kharkov or the Kharkiv region, depending on, on which accent you want to use in pronouncing that. The Kharkiv region. The Russians took out most of the energy infrastructure there. It was out of all power for a significant amount of time. There were rumors that the Ukrainian uh, overlords in that area, and remember, there's a mayor there, and that mayor in Kharkiv, the city itself, is essentially, well, I, I don't know what you might call a, an earl that's been appointed by, by Kiev to look after that particular area. But they're not supported by the general population. Um, there were rumors that when the energy went out, it was a case that the Ukrainians, had, when they were fixing it, had decided that they would rather the energy be directed towards the railway systems and towards the military infrastructure rather than the general population. And also that Kiev wants to get the general population out of the Kharkiv area because the Russians are going to advance, but also because 
the Ukrainians, and lots of videos have come out from the Ukrainian uh, soldiers on the ground saying that the residents in the Kharkiv region are in fact reporting to the Russian side where the Ukrainian forces are. And so that's a problematic for the Ukrainians as well. So there's a number of advantages to what is uh, the expulsion of the population by Ukraine's regime in the Kharkiv area. Other people might call it an evacuation, but many people are seeing it as, a, as a, at least a temporary expulsion because people don't want to actually leave the area. We had that scenario a year ago as well in different places where people didn't want to leave because they were waiting for the Russians to come because they, yeah. they, they were on the Russian side. So there is an, a predicted advance in the Kharkiv, Kharkiv region over the next month or two. That's been predicted by the Ukrainians. The Russians never talk about their future plans. Uh, the Ukrainians tend to constantly talk about plans that never, never come to fruition. The Ukrainians themselves are now talking about another uh, counteroffensive where they're talking about taking the Odessa region. It's highly unlikely that this is going to happen. But this is the wishful thinking that seems to go on in Kiev and that Kiev communicates to the to EU leaders, to, to their British counterparts and to the Americans as well. That's covering Kharkiv. We know that there have been several attacks on Russian soil and different types of attacks over the last month. And that's something else that's up the north area. So that would be north of the Kharkiv region, across the Sumy region, into Belgorod, across the border from Ukraine into Russia. These attacks have a, a number of different forms. There was actually ground forces that entered the Belgorod region and a small village just across the border. And what the Ukrainians have a habit of doing is sometimes they send a very small unit into a village. They'll stick their flag on it, they'll get a video, and then they'll pull back and they'll announce publicly that they've they have infiltrated and taken and controlled this area. And that seems to what have been what was happening with these incursions across the Russian border into these small settlements. There was very little damage done. There wasn't really any battle taking place. And the forces that were used were both Ukrainian forces, mercenaries from countries around the world, probably some NATO involvement in terms of organizing it, and a band or a group that called themselves the, the Free Russian something or other, Freedom Fighters, something like this, which are essentially a band of Nazis that were collected from Ukraine and Russia that were formed into a military unit to make it look like there's homegrown resistance to Putin within Russia, military resistance, which is, is complete rubbish. And the, the, their attempt to go in and take parts of Belgorod was, again, ultimately a show of failure. They felt that the, the, the world and that the European leaders and, and America and Britain would say to themselves, my goodness, not a wonderful feat, was not a wonderful uh, invasion that they had of Russia. It was a, it fizzled out into nothing. There was nothing in it. The second type of attacks that's been happening is attacks on, on Russian towns and cities further across the border, including Moscow where there were drone attacks. Again, most drones have been shot down uh, by Russian air defences, but one or two have got through. Then there's been attacks on oil refineries and production. The Americans got very annoyed by this, when, when they were, so they say it publicly anyway, when this was done because they were afraid that it would affect the price of energy. I think maybe that was a bit of a, a, a con that the Americans were putting out to us because they don't want to be directly linked to attacking uh, Ru Russian oil refineries, a bit like they didn't want to be linked to the attack on the Nord Stream. And then we have these terrorist attacks. We've had several terrorist attacks over the last two years against civilians in Russia. We had the killing of a, of a well-known blogger who was in favour of Russian policy in Ukraine. Uh, he was blown up at an event in which he was given an award, a statue, and the statue was actually a bomb. We had the murder of uh, Dugan, um, a famous philosopher in Russia. His daughter was blown up in a car. Again, that was claimed by, by Ukrainian affiliates, if we want to put it like that. And we had the attack on the Crocus Music Hall in Moscow, which I'm sure we've all seen video footage of a few weeks ago, coming just after the Russian presidential elections. And it may appear that it was actually planned to happen during the presidential elections, but it didn't happen for a week or two afterwards in the end. The footage of that infuriated the Russian population. I'm not sure what the design of it was. The design, I think, was to get the Russian people to say, hey, there's too much trouble in our country with this war. Let's stop it. 
But what actually happened was the Russian people were infuriated to see women and children being put in corners of a shopping mall and a music hall and being gunned down in cold blood. And that's what happened. The result of it has been that although people are talking about that this was Islamic terror, ridiculous, uh, that the Americans would come out within an hour or two and say that they're absolutely sure this was ISIS. This was ISIS that conducted this attack. Now, we all know what ISIS is. ISIS has been a create. ISIS is a franchise, first of all, depending on where you are. But it is a creation of British and American, Israeli and at one time Saudi uh, secret services. And, and military intelligence to destabilize Syria, to destabilize the Middle East. So when they come out with this, it was ISIS. And then some website claiming to be an ISIS account said it was them. It's just ludicrous. Mm-hmm. Qui bono is the question all the time we should ask. And it's quite clear that there has been Ukrainian involvement in this. Video mm-hmm. footage come out, which I think nobody can agree with, of when one of the attackers in the Croco City Hall attack when he was eventually caught fleeing towards the border in Ukraine, a number of uh, Russian uh, special service soldiers held him down, and one of them cut his ear off on camera. Not acceptable and on, in any context. They were presented then in the courtroom, beaten to a pulp. The fury of Russian police, Russian army, and the Russian population to what was done in Crocus City Hall. I believe that one of them had their penis cut off, And when he was brought into the courtroom, he had a catheter in its place and he was in medical garb as if he had just come out of an operation. And he was clearly looked like he was under some some kind of a drug when he was wheeled into. To my mind, that's just not acceptable in any context. But I think that the treatment, the public mistreatment of the attackers was a message being sent out to the individuals and the personalities themselves that might consider doing this on behalf of Ukraine or anybody else into the future, that you will be severely abused and mistreated when you're caught. I think that that was the message that went out there. So they're the forms of, of, of attacks, petty attacks that have been happening that will never change the course of this war. No. But for some reason, the Russians, the, the Ukrainians and their backers feel that this will have some impact on Russian public opinion to go against Putin. When, of course, like everything they've done, it's had the opposite effect of what they've expected uh, it to have. Macron is the next guy to talk about, the French president. What or who the hell is that fella? (laughs) On the one hand, he's, he's, he's begging Russia for a ceasefire. Now, we all know what happened the last time Russia and Ukraine had an agreement, the Minsk one and two agreements, and had ceasefires. Western leaders admitted over the last three years that actually those ceasefires was just a ploy so that they could arm Ukraine more to eventually have this war with Russia. So Macron begging and pleading for a ceasefire is ridiculous. But on the other hand, he's trying to build a coalition of the willing to actually go into Ukraine to fight the Russians. He's saying now that he's committing 20,000 French troops to cross the Ukrainian border and to start fighting with the Russians. And he's looking for support from this. And believe it or not, he's getting... Now, the Americans say publicly they're totally against it. The Germans say publicly they're totally against it. But some of the the Baltic states are starting to sound like they're in favour of it. Now, the Polish president a couple of days ago, he goes from... He swings from cold to hot on an hourly basis. I think he might be going through the menopause or something. I don't know. But (laughs) he... um, on the, like yesterday, he said he doesn't see any threat to Poland from Russia, military, immediate military threat. On the other hand, he seems to be dancing with Macron in this waltz of, of death that Macron is building. Now, the outcome, possibly, and maybe what Macron is trying to cre- create as an outcome, is that he will draw the traditional allies into this war and that he'll be seen as Napoleon Bonaparte or something like that, leading the entire alliance. He'll end up the same way as Napoleon if he does. He will. He'll be I'd, yeah. I'd like to see him frozen on a sled, leaving his troops behind him and trying to fly to Paris because Paris is uprising against him as well, which is yeah. essentially what, what happened to Napoleon. Um, yeah, I see David Cameron yesterday was expressing mm. a bit of support for Macron as well. Yeah, All you yeah. people with the children of British age, army age, should really start thinking about finding a safe billet for them. Roddy, 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 show some respect. It's Lord Cameron. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Lord Elsho, Elsho have respect. Yeah, so, so, this, so what did what what did that uh, MP that that left wing MP Labour politician and one of the older fellas, I think he's Cockney oh, London. What did he call left wing Labour? Left wing Labour. Oh, I think this, is made a mistake, was, this is old. No, this is old school Labour. Um, and a few years ago, we stood up in, in the British Parliament, and he called he called David Macron. Uh, he called um, David Cameron Slick Dave or something. Oh, what do you call him? What do you call him? The Bolsover Bolshe. What do you Dennis call him again? Dennis Skinner. 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 Yeah. And he really nailed it with Cameron uh, when when he called him Slick Dave. And this is Slick Dave coming in again to probably to represent the, the military companies in Britain and elsewhere. Now, remember, it's important to remember that the U.S. economy appears to be buoyed at the moment, not with production of general commodities uh -huh. that you sell internationally, but with the production of weapons and with these weapons orders into the future. It looks like, to my mind, Macron and Lord Cameron are trying to get in on the act. Because even if France does not cross that border, the Ukraine border, into Ukraine to fight the Russians, in preparation to do so, they'll have to do a lot of military spending. Uh, the, British army, the British army is a fucking mess. Their navy had to send two different destroyers back from the Red Sea over the last two months for technical difficulties. The British army itself, 40 or 50 active tanks, I think. The, we, you know, when we were at school, unfortunately, we learned a lot of British history at school and we learned about the Boer War and uh, how at one point the British Army, there was an assessment done, a very famous assessment of the conditions of the British Army after losses in the Boer War. And it was assessed that the army was falling apart, that all the soldiers were overweight. It was a complete mess. It sounds like that's back to where the British are, if not a hell of a lot worse, because during the Boer War, the British didn't decide to give all their weapons and armory to another country a few years before the Boer War. But that's mm. what the British have done over the last few years. They've depleted everything they have. So I think Lord Cameron is representing an industry. And I think Macron is probably representing an industry as well, because all the polls in France show that there's no support for en engagement or involvement militarily in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, Le Pen and his opponents are growing in stature because of his position on Ukraine. So maybe there's no real intention to cross the border, but this may be about building up Macron's ego and building up the armaments industry within the EU. Because yeah. von der Leyen and a lot of EU leaders have been talking that talk for the last few months about how Europe has to rearm itself. Europe has to start putting money into its own defence. So maybe this is this is a part of that because the European economy is collapsing. But here's the problem that Europe has: where is it going to get? Where is it going to get the materials to build up this new European army or this new British army? Because most of it used to come from Russia and Russian-aligned countries. Where are they going to get it now? Yeah. Another question. Um, yeah, I'm going to get it. There was an attack on the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant over the weekend. The uh, roof of the cooling pod of one of the nuclear reactors was hit by a missile and two other missiles fell. I believe that one hit a food delivery worker and one hit another part of the nuclear power plant. It was conducted by Ukrainians. The Russians are the ones that are in the nuclear power plant and have control of it. It was clearly conducted by the Ukrainians. All of the satellite imagery and the video footage shows are coming from Ukrainian positions. The International Atomic Energy Agency made a statement condemning it the other day, but on the other hand, they never mentioned who did it. Oh, yeah. If it had been the Russians, it would be all over the place. Russia yeah. tries to destroy the world with attack a nuclear power plant, but it was the Ukrainians. So we let this go past. We'll put out a brief statement. We won't say who done it, and we'll just move on. Yeah. So again, is this trying to create an incident attacking a nuclear power plant? Like, what is the Qui bono from there? What is the purpose of that other than to create a ceasefire because there's been a nuclear accident? I, that's the only thing when I tried to think about it. They're all begging for a ceasefire so that they can rearm. And well, Ukrainian. I would think it would be they'll have a nuclear accident and then blame the Russians, and that's the excuse to mm. kill all the, the British, French, Polish kids in a war against the, uh, Russia, which I think we would lose. But can I just ask you uh, on can I, Lloyd? Because you've been sitting there quite quietly. We've probably even got you in. We're in about half an hour in the show. Um, I, I read this today, and I think it sums it up. Russia's not in a hurry to win this conflict. Russia is not under time pressure. 
Russia is not under financial pressure. Russia is not under supply pressure. Russia is not under mobilization pressure. Russia has control over the costs of the military operation per day and manages these expenses. Ukraine is the exact opposite. It really is kind of, that sums it up. It does. And it, it, it's interesting you saying that, Roddy, because I remember be about a year ago, maybe more, when we we first discussed Ukraine with, with Finbar. And I, I, I made quite an issue out of the fact that this is not the military operation like the one they carried out in Chechnya, where they wanted it over and done with as quickly as possible. So it was maximum destruction over the minimum period of time. And what we, and, and that is, you know, has been standard Russian military tactics for, for decades now. So to see what's happened in the Ukraine over the past couple of years is, is quite extraordinary. It is very much like the Russians are operating with one, you know, with a handbrake on or one foot on the, the brake itself. Um, I think it, 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 picking up on what, what Finbar said about the attack on the nuclear power station in Zaporizhia. Now, the last time this happened, it was at a point where Ukraine was screaming out for more arms and more support from the West. And they, they shelled Zaporizhia, if I remember correctly, right not long after the Russians had captured it. And that seemed to draw the attention of the West. And I just thought to myself when the, when the attack happened the other day, is this another desperate attempt by Zelensky and the, and the Ukrainians to convince the rest of Europe or the world that they need more weapons? Because they're in a competitive market at the moment, Roddy. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the air defence requirements of, of Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, the Lebanon, Turkey, are, are soaking up an enormous amount of the air defence missiles that are available on the, on the open market. And the Ukrainians are without doubt the bottom of the list at the moment. I think that, that's, that's fairly obvious. But the, in the end, it always comes back to the same thing. It's the tragedy of unnecessary death. This, you know, it, 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 we say it over and over and over again, this could have been sorted out and indeed was sorted out with the Minsk Accords. The fact that they were completely dumped into a bin somewhere has led us into this ridiculous situation. But also, you know, what's history? How's history going to you know, really analyse this? How did a guy go from being a comedian on a Saturday night television programme to being the president of a country attempting to have a, a war with a, a nuclear armed state it's it, it you know there's there's a hell of a lot more to this than meets the eye and uh hopefully it'll all come out in the wash mm -hmm. yeah i would just say that um as everyone knows the day the tanks crossed into the donbass i'm not going to go talk about justification here or not i have been screaming as a peace stick for um a ceasefire from that day and i, I do today mm -hmm. and i will again when we're just about to talk about palestine so for all you idiots like Pete Wisher who say that makes me a Putin apologist and a Russian spy and whatever, you're a dafty. I'm opposed to all wars and to all killing. And whether they be Ukrainian lives or Russian lives, Palestinian lives or even Israeli lives, all lives are precious and I'm against it. You know, war to me means that diplomacy and politics are failed and that is a failure of us all that will allow it to happen. That's all I'm saying. But to move on, if I may. Roddy, Roddy just on that. Um, people are quite often are weaponizing the concept of peace itself. They're actually weaponizing it. As an example, Zelensky has produced a so-called peace plan. And yeah. the Sw Swiss authorities have, have called for a peace conference based on this peace plan. And this peace plan is so unacceptable. Just... It's outrageous. So they want the Russians to pull back to 1991 borders. They want the Russians to hand over their generals and their political leaders to go and to go to an international tribunal. This is what Zelensky's so-called peace plan is about. So then they call this Swiss conference. They, they, they're hoping that places like China will turn, countries like China will turn up. They've invited most of the global south in the hope to change the mind of the global south, which is firmly behind Russia on this issue. But they haven't invited the Russians. So the Chinese have said they're not going to any peace conference that's based A, on Zelensky's peace plans, which are unworkable, and B, that don't have the Russians sitting at the table. The Russians said they're not going to the, to the so-called peace conference in, in Switzerland because it's based on the Zelensky peace plan, which is just a joke. You said that you said that Zelensky was a comedian. I think you're raising him a few tiers above his level. He was a clown. A comedian quite often 
understand psychology and intellect. They may not have studied it at school, but they get it and they can they can get, get into our intellect. All he did was do things like play the piano with his penis. So sorry, sorry for shocking anybody with that language, but that's the kind of japery that he got up on up to on Ukrainian TV and then became the president of Ukraine. Comedian, no, clown. Clown is the word. Absolutely. But another thing I noticed that the, the propaganda, the latest one is after the election of Putin getting 83%, um, the, the Americans put this new thing and you'll notice it, folks, in the Western media. They don't call him President Putin anymore. They give him his name, Vladimir Putin. They won't give him the title of President to try and uh, undermine his election result because, you know, only in America and the UK um, is there a legitimate elections everywhere else. They're, they're rigged. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's where we are. Um, but there is the other one, the worst of things that are going on just now. Well, at least in Ukraine, it's a combatant against combatant. And there are, yes, there are civilian casualties, but they are minimal. Um, even though Ukraine seems to attack um, civilians more than, than they do attack the Russian army, it's kept a minimum. But in Gaza, that's completely different. Teddy, can you stick up that picture? Jason Hinkle, the American podcaster, put up this picture earlier today, and I think it sums it up and really encapsulates the problem in Gaza. There you go, Hiroshima and Gaza. Can you spot the difference? It's like one of those spot the differences. It's very difficult. Mm. Um, it's quite stark, is it not, Finbar, the destruction in Gaza. Uh, and that picture, I think, is quite, uh, quite telling. In October, November, the images kept on reminding me of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, that image there just magnifies that even more, doesn't it? That comparative image. It's just horrific. The idea that somebody would argue that this is not genocide. A lot of the public have this simplified view of genocide, that you have to have gas chambers and it has to be <laughs> systemized. Genocide means trying to destroy a population based on certain characteristics. OK, destroying a population doesn't mean killing every member. It means separating them out around the world, dispersing them through tragedy and crisis and, and, and attacks and fear to the point where they are not a community. They're not a people anymore. They've been dispersed to the point that they fade even in memory. That's genocide. That's what's happening here. The entire civilian and cultural and medical system of Gaza has been purposely identified for destruction by the Israeli forces for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to wipe out the people of Gaza, the Palestinians. And when they've done that, have no doubt, they will move on to the West Bank. The extremists that are running Israel at the moment and the extremists that are going to get elected in greater numbers in the next upcoming Israeli election, and it's coming soon, those extremists believe that Israel should go from the the within Iran to the Tigers, I think it is in Iran, right over to Egypt yes, yes. and into this into Egypt itself. They believe that Israel is this massive empire and that is what their entire being is dedicated to creating. To the extent that they can create in their own mind a hierarchy of humanity mm -hmm. in which the Palestinian people are at the bottom and they're at the top. These are Zion, Zion fascists. Zio Nazis, that's what these guys are. There's no doubt. And they're moving on to the West Bank next. This is genocide. And those mm -hmm. images are just the, the, the physical manifestations of what's going on in the Israeli leadership's heads, what their plans are. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lloyd, uh, the, 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 the notice said today that the Israeli army is pulling out of uh, southern Gaza. But Netanyahu said um, that he's a date, they know when they're going to go into Rafa, even though the Americans have said don't do it, even though the ICJ have said don't do it, even though the EU have said don't do it, they're going to do it, and this is them regrouping. What is it going to take to stop this? I really, really don't know, Roddy. I mean, you know, we, we nothing can be the same again in the future for Israel, the Israeli government, and the Israeli population. They have proved themselves to be at minimum inhumane and completely uncaring for the lives of others. But this is where we have to go to what creates the justification for not only the existence of Israel, but the, the, the current Israeli government. And that is their, their principles are that you do not have to tell the truth 
to anyone other than other Israelis. And that's the way they operate. The killing of the, the targeted attacks on the World Kitchen volunteers and the three separate drone strikes on the three separate cars tells us exactly what the Israelis think of public opinion outside of their own country. It doesn't matter to them because when someone's dead, you can't bring them back. And the purpose of the killing of the of the World Kitchen operatives was there was a flotilla of aid sitting in Cyprus ready to sail, all run by voluntary organizations not dissimilar to World Kitchen. And this was Israel sending a message to those voluntary organizations that if you come here, we will kill you. And as a result of that, that flotilla did not sail. It's still sitting in Cyprus. They, 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 Israel achieved what it wanted to achieve. It created fear and alarm, and it created death. And the simple, straightforward fact is that from the beginning of this event, Israel has operated on the basis of you do something, and if you need to apologize later, but you've achieved your aim. That individual or that hospital or that UNWRA compound has been destroyed. There is no going back. You can't undo what Israel has done. And what they have done is without doubt the most, out with the Rwandan genocide, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my lifetime. And Israel cannot, cannot be allowed to manipulate politics in other countries it cannot be allowed a free pass into the future. There has to be, there must be a price to pay for Israel this time, without a doubt. I agree 100%. Now, Alan, I'm about to show a, a video, uh, Finbar, of your new Prime Minister, Tiershik, <laughs> I beg your pardon. And I know you don't like this guy, you don't share his politics, but the point is I want to put this up to play it because I know that I will never hear Rune, Rishi Sunak saying anything similar. I know I won't hear Joe Biden or Schultz or Van der Leiden or Tusk saying this, but I think it, it, it I, I share his words. I don't know about his politics. You'll be able to tell us about that. Techie, can you stick up the video of the, the Irish Tearshuk, the new Irish Tearshuk? Prime Minister Netanyahu, let me say this to you this evening. The Irish people could not be clearer. We are repulsed by your actions. Cease fire now and let the aid flow safely. My friends, we need a two-state solution with Israel and Palestine living side by side in peace and security. And tonight from Galway, I reiterate that Ireland stands ready to recognize the state of Palestine. Now, irrespective of his politics, Finbar, if the, the, the ones I mentioned previous to this, would say the same. Maybe that would stop the Israelis. Noel Coward had a lovely play, and you can get, you can get it on YouTube. But it's called Waiting in the Wings, and it's about a, a home for retired actresses who've fallen in hard times. And there's one line in it, just I just love this line, and it's one of the old retired wicked actresses, and some man comes into the room and she goes, I don't know who you are, but you smell of horses. Well, I'd, I'd just change it a little bit here and I'd say, I don't know who you are, but you smell of horseshit. And that's my my feelings about that speech. Um, he's a member of the ruling party. The ruling party have refused to even call the Israeli ambassador in to explain what's going on in Gaza. That's the minimum that they could have done. When Russia went into Ukraine, the Irish government called the Russian ambassador into the Department of Foreign Affairs and he was told to send home some of his staff. He wasn't sent home, some of his staff were. That hasn't happened. When the Israeli ambassador appears on national uh, television, so this is a publicly funded broadcast television from RTE, treated with absolute respect, given as much time as she wants. However, when the Russian ambassador was brought on after the, the, uh, the invasion of the crossing into Ukraine, of Ukraine's borders two years ago, he was shouted at by the main presenter on RTE. And every time he went to speak, to the, he was shouted down in the most obnoxious, couldn't believe 
that this was happening on Irish public television. That's bluster. The Irish position with Israel and Palestine has been, remained unchanged since the 1960s or 70s when the troubles really started. Ireland and the Irish people and the Irish government's policies have been unchanged from the point of view of supporting a Palestinian state. The guy is talking the talk. He's not walking the walk. He's doing what his predecessor did. Made similar speeches, did absolutely nothing. That's my take on this. So this guy is the equivalent of the Tories in, in the UK. That's the party he represents. It doesn't have very much support. It is something like 22 or 23% support, but it is inside of a, of a, a rainbow coalition government of the Greens themselves, a few independents and Fianna Fáil, which was Tory light. Uh, in, in Ireland. And those two parties have dominated for the entire history, but that's coming to a change now. So this guy, as an example, gave a speech before he became a uh, T-shirt today in which he said that one of his main objectives is to push through the hate speech laws and to uh, stop uh, populism. So, um, yeah, so that's the slithery for we Simon Harris. Now, just to give you a bit of background about this guy, this guy went to do, went, uh, went into college in first year, failed and dropped out. He got into politics as a tea boy. Climbed the ladder by standing in the corner, just not making much noise. Boomza. Yeah, everybody will fall and he'll be there. Um, he has had a number of ministerial portfolios. Health, disaster. Yeah. Housing, absolute disaster. Nobody challenged him in the Fianna Fáil uh, race for leadership. And so the Taoiseach leadership, nobody has challenged him because nobody wants the bloody job. The amount of, of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael TDs and councillors that have announced they're not running in the next elections is phenomenal because every doorstep to go to, one key issue in Ireland is mass immigration. It has become a key issue because our population demographics have been fundamentally changed in the last three to four years to the extent that all of our young are leaving because they can't get housing. And we have hundreds of thousands every year of immigrants who are informed and guided and advised to dump their documents before they come into the country. How is that, you know, so this, and we're finding that this has been facilitated by the NGOs that Ireland is financing. We can't house anybody. We were in the middle of a housing crisis before this started. And now we're in a situation where we've got hundreds upon hundreds. So in the last two years, half a million people more. We're, we had a population of 4 million four years ago. Now it's 5.2 million. Just think of those demographics. Hmm. And the fact that none of this was discussed with the Irish people, they signed international agreements for regulating migration to do this and are about to sign more with absolutely no discussion whatsoever. So that's what that slithery Simon Harris represents. Mm -hmm. He may bluster about it's easy to say you're against what Israel is doing. Do something about it. Well, your you're, you're Tories seem to like immigration. Our Tories hate immigrants. Mm. Strange. Straight. But you'll find a lot of the Tories are making money from oh, immigration. Sure. Oh, they do, they don't do it for love of country in any, you know, they don't. For Tories, yeah. after all. So again, uh, talk the talk or they're walking the walk. Okay, Lloyd, another one. Um, there was, of course, the attack on, in Damascus on the Iranian embassy. And the question I put to you is, uh, you know, obviously going to be, um, do they have a right to self-defence and what do we think that will be? But Techie, can you stick up the picture? Because this is how they've provoked the United States of America, Iran. How dare they? It's terrible what they've done. Um, you see how Iran have you know, put their country next door to all these American bases. But Iran is the problem, uh, Lloyd. They're the bad guys, not 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 the ones with the flags. I, I just find it it's extraordinary that they get that Iran gets away with that level of provocation. I mean, moving an entire country so that you're right in the middle of all these American bases, it's, uh, that's extreme measures. Exactly. No, I, 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 here, here we are again. Israel's been carrying out murder and mayhem across the planet since 1948. In fact, prior to 1948. They blew up the, the British ambassador to Egypt outside a hotel in Cairo. They blew up another British uh, ambassador in Rome just after the Second World War. Uh, they... The, the invasion of, of Lebanon in, in 1981, which resulted in the massacres of the, the refugee camp at Sabra and Shatila. It, it's as I said the other night on, the, on, on Prism, Roddy, we, we, Israel operates on the basis of it defends itself at its extremities. So it defends itself by infiltrating and influencing the governments of the world to protect itself. And when that doesn't work, 
then it uses assassination and murder and, and mayhem across the world because it sees itself as being in the position of constant defense. It is in a permanent state of uh, one step down from war at any given time because they are aware. I think it was Ben Gurion who said it, that every day for Israel is a fight to the death because ultimately everyone wants the death of Israel. That's not exactly the quote, but the first line of it was absolutely the quote. But that, that is their mentality. It's the, it's the words that are not spoken. So the, Israel can, yes, can go and kill Iranian, Syrian, Lebanese, Turkish, Kurdish, Egyptian, Palestinian nationals anywhere on the, the planet. And sometimes it even kills its own people. You know, the, the, Israel has a, a, a very, very dark past in dealing with its own dissidents. You know, you might remember uh, uh, Mordecai Vananu. Mordecai Vananu was a nuclear physicist, yeah, worked yeah, yeah. at the, 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 the nuclear weapons facility at, at Kiryat Shimona, uh, managed to escape. But the Israelis went and got him and now he, he lives in... Uh, solitary confinement and has done for the past 30 years because he wanted to tell the world about Israel. Israel has no friends. Israel has no friends even within its own friendship group because they are an, a structure, a mentality that sees, sees an enemy in every other person other than themselves. And it's a, it's, it's a spiral to their own doom. And in some ways, what Ben Gurion said is absolutely true. Yes, it will be a fight to the death. And in some ways, it's the Israelis who are creating their own death with the manner in which they're behaving. But also, it suits Britain and it suits America to have destabilization in Syria and still to present Iran as the bogeyman. It's a, it's, it's a foul and disgusting situation and right at the focus of it is the Knesset and the Israeli government. No, I agree. I, here's the thing, Finbar, it's been trailed quite a lot that the Iranians have said that they've been in touch with America, you know, these backdoor communications that states have, and they've said to the Americans, well, there is going to be repercussions, but you better not step in. And apparently the Americans have agreed, that, you know, what Israel did was wrong. We have to believe the Americans didn't know, or will we ever know. Um, and uh, they say they're not going to take any action against Iran when they go for a reprisal, which they will. And, I mean, they have got weapons and weaponry that can hurt Israel. But they don't have to take direct action themselves. Israel is one of their arms. They just get Israel. They do it through Israel, you know, to, to take any revenge for the revenge is tit-for-tat business. I think it's important to, while we are looking at the histrionics of Israel, to remember that Iran had, and still has, but had many Jewish communities living in it prior to the formation of the Israeli state happily and safely. And when the Israeli state was being formed, the Israeli terrorist groups and government of the time and its terrorist groups attacked Jewish communities, attacked their own in Iran, in Iraq, in Egypt and other areas to convince them that the only safe place they could live would be within the boundaries of this new Israeli state. And that's how insipid and, and just how underhand and malicious and wicked, and I'll use the word evil, many of these people are in the, their machinations and the way they plan things. But that mentality that you were talking about, Lloyd, that's the mentality that has existed now since 1947 amongst the driving forces within Israel. The American talk about not responding if the Iranians, I just don't believe it for a minute, they always respond through Israel. You know, America is not arming and supporting Israel for the good of its health. <laughs> you know, it's to dominate the Middle East. They tried to do the same with the Saudis, but the Saudis are a lot slippier. But they, they, they basically built and control Israel. And does this talk about the Israelis controlling the Americans by, by infiltrating the American government and financing all these senators and all these congressmen? It's hard to tell which way is which. Are we seeing two different animals when really it's just one animal? Mm. If you but, understand me. Yeah, well, I mean, it's American tax dollars that finance Israel. They give them all the money and then they use it to go back to America and 
uh, and pick all these congressmen and senators. But the, the thing that you alluded to, it, Lloyd, was about you know the the control they have over the, the narrative, over the media, over entertainment, over you know the, the, they've got fingers in every pie. But the one that's always come out is oh, there's Russian and Chinese bots, and they're the ones who are attacking social media and trying to influence people. But here's Elon Musk, the owner of X, once known as Twitter, and always will be known as Twitter by me, because I'm an old person who will not change their mind. Techie, can you stick up Elon Musk's statement today? Here it goes. The West is the source of fake activity and social network, not Russia, the platform's owner, Elon Musk, said. Now, as I've said when this went out on, on X Twitter, etc. Um, no surprise to a lot of us. Was it a surprise to you when you heard that it's not the, the Russians, but it is the West where all this propaganda and bots are coming from? No. Um, every time every time Russia gets the blame or China gets the blame or in the distant past, you know, when we had a cod war with Iceland, Iceland got the blame. I always try and look at it from the other end of the telescope. Because having grown up in Britain, you know, one of the most devious and wicked countries oh, that the uh, history has ever known, you have to look at things from the from from the other end. And any time, you know, it, it, it's, it's it's the same old politics. Pick out a bogeyman. We need to have a bogeyman. If you don't have a bogeyman, how can you have a military industrial complex? You've got to have somebody to either sell the weapons to or or to to use them on. So it's no, it's it, it, no, it's nothing new to me. I just think that uh, every time anything is said by a senior government official, the British government or the American government, with relation to any foreign country, look at it from the other end and find out whether or not what our so-called governments are telling us bears any resemblance to the truth of the circumstances. Yeah, just remember that, folks, when you're seeing all this, when you're getting told the lying to you, the lying. They've lied to you your whole life. They've lied to you about everything. No, but isn't, it, isn't it a sad state of affairs when politics has been dragged to such a low point in the gutter that any type of proper debate or engagement will involve slanders of far-right Putin apologists? And as an example, when we're talking about X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it there, there was this um, network called NAFO. North Atlantic Fellow Organization. And it was dedicated to promoting the Ukrainian side of things online. And it was the most horrible people you could meet. And they seemed to be operating bots as well, because what would happen would be, let's say that you shared a post which countered their narrative about what's happening in Ukraine in some way. They would come online and say, in the most obnoxious language, things like, fuck you, you fucking Putin bastard scum a line but full of expletives no engagement in the topic just expletives and to most people who are on twitter or on x they're polite people and when they see that they get a shock and they go, oh, I'm, I'm staying away because then suddenly 50 nafo will be having you'll be put on a list straight away you'll have 50 nafo attacking you with all these insults and for most people with thin enough skin that turned them off going on to Twitter or on to X to engage in these kind of conversations. And that was what their objective was. And these bots, how you know it's a bot, it'll constantly insult you with one-liners, but it won't engage in any type of debate or discussion or conversation because it can't. It's a bot. It's a robot. It's a computer system. Mm -hmm. That will change soon with AI, unfortunately. But that's the type of people and organizations and networks that I think Elon Musk was referring to. And in particular about the Ukraine issue. However, I wonder, would he be equally open and frank when it comes to Israel? Because there's a lot of NAFO-type things happening online with pro-Zionists who are yeah. doing the same thing again, just attacking with insults and, and abject lies that are so easily dis uh, disproven, but mainly with insults. And mm. Musk has seemed a lot more favorable to Israel in this kind of a scenario, he visited Israel, he went and he shook hands. So he did a very strange thing a few months ago. He shared and supported an obviously anti-Semitic tweet that was talking about Jews importing immigrants into America. Musk did this. And two or three days later, he was then visiting Netanyahu, shaking hands with him. And I think what Musk 
was trying to take us through his personal experience and make us have the same metamorphosis as he did to support Israel. He purposely came out pretending he was insulted Israel, he's being anti-Semitic. And then he kind of made the public apology, oh, I made a mistake. Now, I visited Israel, everything's really lovely there. And then he was shaking hands with Netanyahu. And he was trying to get us to have that change of opinion experience by living it through him, I believe. That's what he was doing within that one week where he put out such an overtly anti-Semitic statement supporting another anti-Semitic statement, which nobody would have done. You would have been insane to do it, but he did it. And then a few days later, he's making his apology, shaking hands and chummying up to Netanyahu. That to me was very, very choreographed. So I appreciate it. Do you know what it's a bit like? It's a bit like I watch some of these uh, military summary and other uh, online programs that come out on an almost daily basis about the uh, actual battle developments and war developments in Ukraine, about where people have moved and all this kind of stuff, what was attacked, etc. I will go with the facts that they're presenting, but I will ignore all of their opinions because their opinions, because their opinions are so off the mark sometimes. But the facts they present are pretty reliable over time, but their opinions and their, their predictions have been way off. Same with Musk. If he brings in some facts that are statistically provable, I'll accept those facts to a degree. But when it comes to where he's coming from, don't trust him one minute. <laughs> no, his lips are moving. Um, the, the, but that's the thing, the lying that's going on everywhere, and the denial, uh, Lloyd. I mean, the, the White House press uh, briefings are, are really quite appalling. We, where they, the US says, we see no signs uh, or evidence that Israel has breached any international law. Um, the, it's all Hamas, Hezbollah and Iran, they're the baddies. Israel is the victim, while it's bombed four country, different countries today. And the Germans are no different. The Germans are carrying that Holocaust conscience. And they seem to, they've increased their sales of arms to, to Israel. And it's almost as if they're trying to solve their own conscience because of the previous generation's slaughter of six million Jews in the concentration camps. But they're up in front of the ICG. And uh, Teki, can you stick up that uh, picture um, of the ICG? Um, this is the Germany. Line. On whatever basis or definition a so-called right of self-defense is invoked, it can never serve to justify violations of the norms of the Genocide Convention or other norms of international humanitarian law. Surprisingly, Germany seems not to be able to differentiate between self-defense and genocide. Furthermore, Germany cannot invoke that Israel is in some state of necessity of its assistance for its defense and survival. In spite of its size and population, Israel is on the top 10% of the most militarily powerful countries in the world. Its per capita expense is more than four times larger than that of Germany. It is even higher than that of the United States. So, uh, here's the thing, Lloyd. Is the West still carrying the guilt and burden of allowing six million Jews to be slaughtered by the Nazis uh, in the Second World War? Yes, 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 we are. Uh, and the reason that that is still a playable card in this game is because Israel and its allies have maintained that concept since the end of the Second World War. Um, I find it interesting that, you know, today, apart from Nicaragua uh, calling for Germany to cease its, uh, its provision of arms to, to Israel, Another part of the Nicaraguan case is the corruption of free speech within German society. They've effectively said that they're in breach of the European Convention of Human Rights because of their behaviour towards pro-Palestinian demonstrators. Uh, that, and that, I think, is, a, is, a, is an interesting development. But I think what's really, what, what, what's becoming plainer and plainer and plainer is the disconnect between the political elite and the, the 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 ordinary citizens in Ireland, Germany, Britain, France, all over the world, over support for Palestine. The political class are still living with the guilt. Maybe that's because they are part of the political class. And if you look at someone like von der Leyen, she's only one step away from uh, having been part of the very regime that, that carried out the Holocaust. And I think that they are more conscious 
of it than their populations are because I think ordinary people see that you cannot excuse the behaviour of today based upon the behaviour of three generations ago. I think what people are seeing and hence the, 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 the continued uh, support for the Palestinian people is because they're seeing that destruction right here and now today. And people have, are, 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 are moral based on what happens now. And they, I, I don't see the majority or I don't hear the majority of the people who are on demonstrations carrying that guilt. If anything, what they're saying is, how is it possible that the people who suffered so extraordinarily during the, the period of the Nazi regime, how they can be behaving in a manner not in the least dissimilar to the way that they were treated. I think that's that in the end is is the disconnect. And this is where if we had some true statesman, people would stand up and say that this is no longer viable to simply react and behave towards Israel based on the guilt of 80 years ago. It's 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 no way to proceed forward. No, I agree. 100%. Well, if you were to apply that principle to general criminal law, if somebody was the victim of a crime 30 years ago, does that give them free reign to do anything today? Yeah. Uh, that's the thing. When, when the first hospital was damaged, Finbar, and the Israelis said, well, it was because the, the Hamas had an underground... Uh, compound down there and they were attacking Israel from there and everyone sort of think gave them, well most people gave them the benefit of the doubt, went fair enough they've now destroyed 36 hospitals how can any nation, how can anyone after 36 hospitals have been destroyed, can anyone say this is not a genocide, this is not a, a wiping out of a people and a, a complete society they went into a Schieffer hospital there last week, maybe two weeks ago now. And uh, when they left Al Schieffer hospital, the footage was something I've never seen before. Bodies everywhere, crushed. Piles of bodies ran over by tanks, crushed. And nothing hidden in the footage. You could see everything. It was just horrific. Babies decomposing in incubators. The horror. I don't think the Germans even did that, did they? That they no. went into hospitals and wiped out hospitals in the way that these guys are doing it. These are these are new levels of horror. You're going back about talking about this collective guilt that maybe the political... They have no guilt. This is a tool. The Holocaust in the 1940s is a tool to be used. There's no guilt there. These guys are sociopaths in the main, I believe. They don't have a sense of guilt. They have a sense of utilitarianism. How can I use this to my best advantage? That's what they're all about. Destroying the hospitals, it's quite clear what they're doing. Hit one hospital by accident, maybe bearable. 36, every hospital in Gaza, it's clear what they are doing. The mm. stories about underground headquarters, underground, uh, beneath the hospital at the beginning, when they started to attack the hospitals, that was patently disproven within 48 hours mm -hmm. of the story coming out. But it had moved on because by that time there was another hospital under attack. And then the Israelis gave, gave up even making excuses for it. If there's no hospital, then people have to leave. Where do you flee when your child has been hit by a, a, a piece of masonry or crushed? Where do you take them? Where do you go? If, if the hospitals are gone, you, you lie down where you are and you die or you move, one or the other. And that's the calculation that the Israelis have made by taking out all the hospitals. It's just another tool of the genocide. Yeah, absolutely disgusting. And the clock's beating us here, Lloyd. We've got one last thing I want to do. Now, we in the UK are as guilty as anyone, our government, our opposition are all. Um, they're complicit. There's no getting away from it. I'm not going to mince words. They're complicit in this genocide. But it's the way they try and avoid it. Techie, can you stick up? This is the Labour Party um, being caught out, being genocide enablers, every last one of them. And I want you to remember that, folks, when it comes to time for election. Remember what this these people are doing here. Please play it, Techie. This is a really difficult conversation.
complex, serious and deeply held issue. Do you think Israel breached international law by cutting off power and water supplies? Do you think cutting off food, water and electricity is within international law? Do you think Israel is abiding by international law? I think that Israel has an absolute right to defend itself That's against not the terrorism. Question I asked. I'm not going to sit in your studio and grandstand and tell you that I'm going to make big pronouncements about what Israel is and isn't doing. As I say, I mean, it's very difficult at the moment because this is happens. This is all happening so fast. Mm -hmm. What would your red lines be? There's been accusations of white phosphorus being used of collective punishment of bombing of safe routes. What are your red lines? Here has shown real leadership in setting forward our position. What I'm not going to do is, 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 is adjudicate on each and every example that um, people may understandably want to put to me. To do you support the order to move them or not? The order to move them? Well, yes. clearly. Just yes it, or no? It's not a yes or no, Victoria. I'm, I'm hoping one day to be Foreign Secretary and, and achieve diplomats, so it's not a yes or no. The Defence Force say civilian deaths in this conflict are inevitable in order to eliminate Hamas. Do you accept that? Uh, I was an aid worker for almost 10 years. It's, it's really just a yes or no. I accept that when there is war, there is civilian camp casualties. It's clear to me that it's wrong to bomb a refugee camp. Um, but clearly, if there is a military objective, it, it can be legally justifiable. Keir Starmer is not a protest leader. He understands why people are calling for a ceasefire. But he believes that for those two reasons, for now... That is not the right approach. Some of my colleagues who think it's more important to make a gesture. Still a re relatively small number of junior front bench colleagues who've said this. They almost exclusively represent very heavily Muslim pop uh, constituencies. Here's position is the right one. A siege is appropriate. Cutting off power, cutting off water. Well, I think that Israel does have that right. Disgraceful. I, I, I'd put a lot of them in the, the Hague. A lot of that would be worth it. They'd all get found not guilty because that's corrupted as well. But it's disgraceful, is it not, Lloyd? Absolutely, Roddy. Uh, I think maybe we're beginning to see with some of the, the senior diplomats and maybe some of the politicians too that they're uh, beginning to understand that there is a concept of complicity and that uh, I think some of them will be will be thinking about finding their way to escape because in the end many of these people should be should be facing court that's that's all there is to it i wouldn't be putting them in jail no what i do is i'd wrap them in palestinian flags and i put them in the middle of gaza right in the scope of israeli snipers that's what i do now we're in trouble that's good to remember. thank you for that mate well that's what they're supporting <laughs> isn't it it is uh on that note, we come to the end. I, I, my heart's breaking every day, and I, I'm finding some of these images that you get. That certainly, you don't see in Western media, but if you go to places like Telegram, folks, they will give you the horrors. And I think everyone should see the horrors to know, to so that when the pressure keeps up, it's appalling what's happening there to civilians, um, children. It's just horrible. And you know I what I one saw? Day, you know what I saw this morning? I saw a child with no eyelids, because phosphorus has burned her. And I've never seen a child smiling before with no eyelids. Never thought I would. It'll break your heart. It's just horrible. Let the war end. Let's, let, you know, even Churchill, one of your warmongers said, you know, there's World War, but you need at the end to have jaw, jaw, jaw. And that's what we need in the Ukraine and in Palestine and in other places of the world, the Congo, etc. Let's stop this. Stop making a few Americans very rich and let's start getting some peace going. Mm. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, if that's the right word to use. Um, but until we see you again, you and yours, please, please take care. Bye bye, guys. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro Scottish independence and anti Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.